Lately, I've been reading uh, Gunning for Hits, and I have with me a part of the uh, creative team for Gunning for Hits, Casey Silver, who I've gotten to know uh, through uh, his work uh, at Xanadu. Uh, thanks, thanks for being here, Casey. Absolutely. Yeah, fucking rip Xanadu for real. Like, it's Seattle has not been the same comic store wise since, uh, since we went down, unfortunately. That was an amazing store for for a golden period of time. I actually worked right across the street from Xanadu, so you, oh. you ended, up, ended up seeing me a little more often. Yeah, yeah, than usual. And uh, well, both stores were amazing—the U District store and the uh, downtown store. For folks that uh, are not familiar, could you describe Xanadu a little bit? Uh, Xanadu was—it's one of the oldest shops that was open. Perry, the boss, Perry Plush was open for 42 years. He was one of the very, very, very first uh, stores to um, kind of set up when the direct market really became a thing, I guess, in the, you know, late 70s or so. Um, and the thing that really drew me to the store that uh, you don't see anymore is we sold comics. We didn't sell, I mean, we had other stuff, but we weren't a game store. We didn't sell magic. This wasn't this. No, you came here for comic books, you know, not a T-shirt, not a this, not bullshit, fucking comics. <laughs> and that was so awesome and so rare uh, and probably what took us out, to be honest, in the end, you know, is this um, kind of pigheadedness refusal to, I don't know, adapt or maybe kowtow, I guess is a different word. I don't know, hmm. but it's tough, you know, and, uh, uh, you know city has changed and comics have changed and even just in the short time that i was there the industry is, is vastly different from when i became a retailer you know so um but that's the world i guess these days constantly well, uh, i have to mold this into a, a proper interview I, I can't go too crazy so yeah no i'm sorry no, no, no. It's all up to me what happens next. And what I, what I want to happen is make sure that we talk about what you're up to. Sure. Especially with uh, uh, Gunning for Hits, your work as a colorist and a letterer. Maybe uh, you tell me, but maybe a good place to start would be how you got into coloring and lettering. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, I've been making my own comics uh, since about 2010 uh, with my friend Demi Meharis. And um, ooh, helping him do the art, I uh, did what's called flatting. And for anybody who doesn't know what flatting is, you're basically, it's like washing the chef dishes for him. You know, you're kind of like getting, getting it ready for, for, you know, the artist to like kind of cook the meal, as it were. Um, and so that was my very, and a lot of colorists start like that. You start, you know, learning from, from, uh, from somebody else and, you know, you, you kind of do what's called flatting and, and, you know, some people get their foot in the door that way. Some people don't, um, but that's kind of how I started. And then I lettered our books, you know, so I just kind of had to learn. Um, and for many years, I just uh, did writing and then kind of helped with that. Um, and then about maybe three years ago or so, I just kind of started messing around on my own. And then uh, when that came out, when Gunning for Hits came out, that was my first um, kind of like published work where like my name was was actually on it which was cool um and so so it's really only been about like three years that i've really like actively worked on i guess the art side um but uh it's something color has always been something that has really appealed to me in art and when i realized that it was the color more than anything else um i just kind of became a bit more um intrigued on, on how they did it you know and how people color stuff so well, if I'm smart, I will be able to turn this into a fascinating interview for people that are interested in coloring and lettering, because I am interested in that. As an indie cartoonist, I think anybody who becomes an indie cartoonist year after year and really grows into it, yeah. they want to they know everything. I, I was telling this one guy at one convention, you know, 
I think I want to have complete control of my comic because I just don't know what's going to happen in the coloring stage. And he said, you what, you're going to color it? He said, yeah, I think I'm going to color it. And so I know about flatting. And uh, you might agree with me that some indie comics, they're, all, that, all it is is flatting, maybe just a little more embellishments, but you could yeah. take it where basically you're just <clears throat> filling in all the spots, like you select an area for, for skin tone, maybe another area for a little shadow. This will be one color for, a, that's a flat, and then yep. this is a flat and, and so on. Yep. So uh, yeah, and uh, I, I, I like jumped into little opportunities and then jumped back out. Uh, like I, I almost inked for this big guy I can't name his name, but uh, I, I didn't follow directions. That's the, one of the biggest things. He said, draw this and that's it. And I drew this and then a little of that. <clears throat> that was it. That was cut. Yeah. And the guy who, who did the inking went on to some other interesting things. But would you agree that you have to follow directions or else? Or? You you do. It, it Whenever you're working... It's, it's, it's also different when you're working for hire and then, as you said, kind of making your own stuff, you know, and uh, it's, it's a whole different set of rules. And especially as a colorist, <clears throat> you're looking to make that artist's art better. You're not trying to be the artist. You're just trying to embellish what's there. So, you know, you talked about um, how a lot of indie comics are just flats with a little bit extra. You know, uh, there's there's really two schools of thought, you know, as far as like, you know, hyper rendering stuff and then leaving it flat. Um, and it's it's uh, uh, it's a tough choice. Um, but you really you know, when you find out what the artist wants, like it helps to just talk to them, you know, and be like, hey, what are you looking for? And they'll give you some ideas. And, you know, you can only do the best you can, but you try to stay within those parameters. But, yeah, if they're if they're saying, you know, color this and do that, don't add stuff. Then if they wanted you to add stuff, they would have told you. If not, you know, then don't. Um, and that's that's actually really hard because when you start, you just want to like go to town. You know, you're just like, oh, I'm going to shine this bicep and I'm going to do this. And then this sword is going to be awesome. But when you look at it as a page, uh, it doesn't read, you know. And so uh, uh, just a lot of levels of learning. But yes, taking direction, that's kind of necessary if you're working for someone else, you know. I love the artwork in uh, Gunning for Hits, and you were working with. Uh, well, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't keep up with comics. I go through cycles that I. Amoritad is kind of new to me, although I know he's been around. Yeah, he's he's one of those guys that, it, 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 he, he is the most talented, pure artist I've ever seen. You know, we're in like a sushi restaurant and this dude on a napkin with a fucking ballpoint pen can draw you a dragon, a legit nice like Chinese fucking dragon in like two minutes, you know, maybe three on a fucking napkin, you know, but he's um, unfortunately made some bad decisions in his career as far as the comics industry. And, uh, you know, that's why his name is not really out there to be honest, you know, there, there's one thing about being able to do the work. There's a whole nother thing about surviving in something as toxic and weird and bizarre as the comics industry. You know, it's a, it's, that's a whole different video. That's a whole nother conversation kind of thing, you know? <laughs> um, but that's why, I mean, he's, he, I guess like probably his most well-known stuff was he rebooted Jonah Hex for DC New 52, you know, kind of, uh, and that was like, maybe that was like 2011. So, I mean, he's been making comics since I was alive, you know, but uh, like I said, you know, certain decisions, you piss people off, you don't get work. Yeah, it, 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 it goes. <laughs> well, it's, it's mind blowing because uh, if you step on somebody's toes, that's that could be it. It is it. another person. They might not care one way or the other. So, yeah, but you're also working with Moritat uh, on Rat Queens, which is interesting. Yeah, which has been really, he's basically been my mentor. Um, you know, we, we both live here in Seattle and it's cool because so many comics are made by people in wholly different spots of the country. And a comic made only through collaboration by email is very, very different from a comic book made uh, uh, by a collaboration in person. It's, it's a very different beast. And I feel lucky that we share a studio and that we're able to just kind of work on the art together. 
you know, so he'll leave stuff unfinished and then I'll add some color and then he'll go back on top and like put some of his final touches, stuff like that, you know, so it's a really good um, working relationship. And, uh, uh, you know, I just, I just try to keep up with him pretty, you know, to be honest. So, but I've learned, I've learned a hell of a lot from him and uh, uh, doing Rat Queens has been cool and gunning for hits. Um, and it's very interesting to see somebody who is so bulletproof in their art. Like you look at that gunning for hits book and like, it's, it's all there, you know, like it might not be the most crazy rendering, but his storytelling, you know, his silhouettes, the way he puts his shapes, his lines, what he chooses to ink and not, it's, it's brilliant, you know? And I only really have noticed now that I've worked with him, you know, and it makes me realize how much a lot of um, current professional artists, you know, some younger people have no real storytelling training, you know? Um, and that's a big disconnect with modern comics for me is that sure, there's some good artists, but their storytelling is not very good. In comic books, you know, there's artists and then there's comic book artists. And those are two very different things. You know, uh, it's, it's a very different um, approach to, to making art. So we, I, I guess in general, you have to love to draw. You have to draw do. all the time. And then you, you have to work your way through a, a bunch of uh, detours. A lot of cartoonists uh, have a generic kind of journeyman style that they, they have to take it further. They have it's, to find a way to take it further. And it's really hard, you know, just in uh, as far as with me in my three years that I've done it, it's taken me until just maybe right now to come to some basic understanding of what I'm doing. And it's been three years, you know, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, and I didn't have any like formal art training or any nature and not that you need it. You really, really don't. Um, but uh, I just, I kind of came at it from left field, you know, so uh, it's been interesting to do um, and, and learn. And, you know, it's tough because like, a real good colorist can draw. I can't draw. I can't draw for shit, you know, at all. Like I can give you some breakdowns and like my storytelling isn't that bad, but like I couldn't draw you a hammer if you asked me to draw me a hand, you know, it, I just couldn't. Um, and so it's interesting to learn, I guess, the things that, that you know, kind of make the form and make the, the uh, kind of the, the communicate uh, the information, you know, and help solidify that more so than learning how to just like, you know, make lines on paper that look like a human. I mean, it's, it's, it's tough taking your style to another level where it's beyond just lines on a page, you know, because you look at some artists and it's not lines on a page, that's like space, you know, where it's like the inside of the earth, or that's like an alternate universe. Like some artists, they're just able to transport you like that you know, and, and that's the goal is to try to transport the reader, you know, but it's really hard <laughs> as you know, you know? Yeah. Oh, so it's, it's very hard. It's, uh, you're talking a little bit about Seattle and the ability to, to just go and talk to that person and in, in, in person or, or share mm -hmm. a studio Could, for folks, uh, who don't know anything about Seattle or the Seattle comic scene. How would you uh, describe that? You know, uh, it's it's strange because while I make comics, especially now that I don't work at the at Xanadu, I don't actually feel like I'm part of the scene other than the three people that I see. Yeah. And um, about four years ago uh, in 2016, uh, I threw a a convention uh, next to Xanadu because we got kicked out of the Emerald City convention when Reed Pop bought it, and they got rid of all the local talent. And so uh, uh, that was the last time, I guess, I really felt, I felt extremely connected to the Seattle comic scene when, you know, like I kind of planted a flag and it was crazy the amount of people that came out of the woodwork, you know, a lot that I knew. Um, but the great thing about Seattle is there are so many artists and so many comic artists and there's a lot of resources out there um, especially pre-COVID, you know, COVID has kind of thrown a monkey wrench in everything. Um, but there's a really, really healthy community of very, very different artists 
uh, in this city that make comics, which, you know, is especially the Northwest. I think Oregon, Washington, and California probably hold 90% of the comic talent in the country. You know, it's a lot. I mean, you got some in New York, but there's a lot out here. And um, uh, it's just amazing who, who you run into and who you knew. they like, oh, yeah, I make comics, you know. Um, so it's, it's very vibrant. Um, but uh, uh, like I said, I just, I just don't feel very connected anymore now that I just don't see these people. You know, Xanadu was a great way to kind of interact with everybody. Um, and so now I'm just like, I'm just in the corner. I don't even know when these books come out. You know, like, I, I'm like, you know, I just see online. I'm like, oh, the book's out this week. Okay. You know, so you're just, I'm just in such a vacuum. You know, I work so much. I work like seven days a week, you know, doing this stuff just all day. And uh, uh, it's one of the things about comics that's tough is the people to create it are usually in a vacuum from people that receive it, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and now that there aren't conventions, eh, that's even more so. You know, COVID, COVID is, the whole industry is very, very different now that COVID happened. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I don't know. I think that we'll come together again. I think that especially Seattle, you know, people get, you know, pushed to the fringes, but that doesn't mean we're gone. You know, everybody's still here. So. Well, uh, COVID is, is a, a multi-layered tragic crisis that we're in a, a pandemic like God, I, so yeah. I, I don't want to make light of it by saying anything disrespectful, but I, how would you say this? I'd say like a positive thing, some, an outgrowth is these Zoom uh, interactions. Yeah. Maybe that's the best way to put it. Uh, Cause I, I don't know that I would necessarily have said, oh yeah, I'm, I'm gonna interview Casey, Casey Silver for sure. Yeah. But with, with Zoom, you have that extra convenience <laughs> Yeah, it allows for something like that to happen. And I'm very strategic uh, with monitoring social media. So I just happened to be looking at Facebook and I saw your post about gunning for hits and that really intrigued me. And so I thought, well, maybe and just my instinct kicked in. I'm going to see what yeah. might come of this. And so we, I just followed through. A lot of it is uh, instinct and then follow through because you can have the instinct and then the, the moment... <laughs> The moment can pass, but uh, yeah, no, it's it's that action, you know. It's very true. It's very true. Um, but yeah, I mean, Gunning for Hits was like uh, uh, the guy that wrote it was David yeah. Bowie's ex record producer. Um, yeah, that's, why that's Bowie true. is on the cover, you know. Yeah, you can... yeah, I'll, Jeff I'll uh, to... Jeff Rugby, yeah, yeah. Up there. Um, he's a uh, he's a really interesting guy. He's he's huge in the music world. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting to be famous in one industry and then be completely unknown in another, you know, but um, he, he's the guy that produced Bowie's Sound and Vision box set from the 80s. And apparently he is uh, the creator of the CD box set in general, like the idea, apparently. Wow. Yeah, apparently. Um, but this dude, he, he, he worked for Ryko Disc for a while. Uh, and he's doing a big Ryko Disc book right now that should be out next year, maybe. Um, but uh, I mean, he's worked with everybody. This dude knew Prince before Prince was Prince. You know, I mean, he knew fucking like Bo. He used to get Christmas cards from Bowie every year. You know, I mean, <laughs> like Lou Reed, Elvis Costello, like you name this shit. This dude met him and worked with him. Um, so it was very cool to just kind of hear stuff from him uh and th and then work with him uh in this on this project that is just really a very very passion thing you can tell that that's what this guy has been burning in this guy's head for a long time um because he's a huge comic dude uh and has been for a very very long time and always wanted to, to to burst into comic books um and so all of the things from this book uh come from stories that either has happened to him or people that he knows, and then he's just kind of either exaggerated or moved around a couple of details. But it's all, you know, mostly based on some form of fact, which when you read it is, is it makes a lot of sense. You know, the music industry, you look at it from a far, uh, uh, you know, angle. Uh, it's, it's a pretty um, repetitious, you know, microcosmic universe of of a lot of things where a lot of bands and a lot of people are taken out by the same thing or they succeed through the same means 
you know, like what works for one, you know, learn and stuff. But, uh, but yeah, and there's not a lot of music comics, you know, that are like really about the music industry. You know, there are comics about music, but I've never seen a comic about the music industry um, and how well he managed to uh, kind of float it into the crime world. You know, how both kind of go hand in hand. Um, so it was it was really cool, you know, and he had a lot of good ideas. Um, but uh, I mean, it was a lot of work. Like, I don't know if they have it in the trades, but I mocked up like fake interviews and newspapers and all sorts of stuff in there. Yeah. That, uh, which was kind of cool. So I got to do, you know, color stuff and design. Yeah, stuff like that, you know, um, which you know, was was pretty cool. Um but yeah, you know, and I learned a lot. Yeah, yeah. And so Jeff actually drew that. Jeff drew, Jeff's an artist as well. So he drew the album cover because Justin drew it, it was too good. I drew it, it was too bad. And so he drew it and it was like just shitty enough, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, it was cool. When, when he came to us with the book, he already had all this shit drawn. And we were like, well, why don't you draw it yourself? And, and uh, uh, he's just, you know, he's just too slow. He, he's an artist rather than a comic artist, you know? Um, but all, like, all the issues were, were done in pictures, in layout, uh, which is how you should write comics. You should not write comics without doing it visually. Anybody out there that's writing comics and you just got a script, you know, think of the poor artist who has to draw those things in those boxes. Um, yeah. And by doing it visually, you're able to see what fits in each box, you know? And it's, it's very interesting, just little things, you know, it's like guy gets off a bus and walks down the street. That's two panels. That's not one. That's two, you know, and unless you visually do that, you don't know that that's two. Um, so, uh, so there was a lot of like, you know, kind of teaching Jeff how comics are made. Um, but, you know, it was his first comic. It was hell, it was mostly my first official comic. You know, I mean, me and Justin, me and Mortad did maybe two small things prior to that for like an anthology um but uh this was really the kind of trial by fire so but yeah and i don't know jeff's working on a second one but that Ryko disc book is is a lot of years and it's like yay thick so it's been a lot of his life hmm. you know yeah uh there's the the right way to do a, a comic uh script where, where you're very descriptive <laughs> or it'll end up just being like a movie script and you're, you're doing mm -hmm. a disservice. But the best way, like you, like, like you just said, is uh, I guess little thumbnails, miniature storyboards. Yep, which really, really help, you know. Um, but it's, it's cool to, for me to collaborate with other people too. You know, I've been realizing that there's kind of like three things. There's like one, learning how to do the work. Two, learning how to collaborate with new people. And three, learning how to survive in the industry and how to survive uh, as a freelancer. You know, I'm, I'm, I still have like a day job, uh, but it's like a day at the bar, you know, which is just different now again because of COVID. Um, but uh, a lot of the hardest thing I've been learning is just mentally how to survive without any money for two months at a time. And then you get money, you know, from comics and stuff like that. And you don't get much money, um, but I get to make art you know, which is yeah. really, you know, so that that's more important. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, I had, you know, I thought it was just doing the work, you know, but it's a real life change. And it's, it's just been very interesting to transition from, you know, going to work where it's like, okay, go do this. You know, you ring these people up or you serve this food or whatever, as opposed to this, where it's just like, there's no, there are boundaries, but they're not like, you don't have to, uh, you know, adhere to them, which uh, sometimes less, restrictions means more freedom, but it also can be more uh, harder to do, you know, just because you have more freedom. Um, so it's just, it's very interesting, you know, people that live like this and that work, you know, and, and Justin Mort has been, an, uh, you know, artist for 20 years. This is how he's lived. And I have no idea how he survived. <laughs> you know, I really don't. I, I have no idea, but he has. So yeah, it, it has to be all self-directed. It is. You know, it's very self-directed, but, you know, it's, uh, again, like I said, I get to make art, I get to make comics, and, and I'm basically, I look at it as I'm being paid to learn, you know, so. so number one, uh, always be nice and polite, because you just don't know. Number yep. two, uh, self-directed. Number three, 
So once you establish a, a situation like a partner or, or a relationship, do you feel like you're set or are you still scrambling for gigs or do you, you have to keep? Yeah, you're, you're always scrambling for gigs. Um, and once you get a connection to somebody, it's it just makes everything a bit faster. You know, it's it's like learning a new language where you guys have to learn or, you know, whoever it is, you have to learn to communicate with each other, you know? And uh, uh, especially there, there's about a 15 year age gap between me and Moritat. Um, so certain things that are my influences that are kind of core influences are stuff that he looks at and goes, what the fuck are you doing? You know, like, why, why do you do it like that? I'm like, oh, well this and that. He's like, yeah, you look at too many comic books. I was like, well, okay, <laughs> you know? Um, and uh, uh, so, so yeah, I mean, learning how to communicate with your partner, with your collaborator is, is huge, 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 especially through email. Like uh, uh, editors now, you know, I've been having to, because when I talk, it's all like, yeah, you know, and shit, and fuck this and whatever. And trying to be like a bit more professional. It's not me, you know? And so sometimes my emails can be mis misconstrued. I've had, you know, one or two things where it wasn't really a problem, but it was just like, why are you yelling at me? I was like, oh, I didn't mean to yell. I, that was, I was just really excited, you know, kind of thing. So um, it, it is just, it's, it's learning how to communicate with people um, and really being aware, at least for me, of where my shit ends and their shit begins, you know, and, and being able to intertwine, but still be creative on your own, you know? And um, so that's kind of a give and take thing. Uh, but but once you're able, like we we now have a real good rapport, Moritat and I, um, and it's been since Gunning for Hits a couple of years now, you know. So it's cool, and and um, you know, he calls me on my stuff, and he's just like, oh, you're not, you know, you're you're thinking about this today, you're you're not paying attention. I'm like, okay, yeah, you know. So it's good to have somebody who's kind of like a check and balance for you, you know, and uh, maybe more accomplished artists or more confident artists. Um, they move past that at a certain point, but I mean, we all struggle, you know, at all times, um, but that is very important. Um, and, and yeah, we always hustle, always, 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 you know, so that's just how it is. Well, let, let's jump in a little bit uh, and talk about uh, 80%. Can, oh, sure. Tell me about 80% Studios. Um, so 80% Studios is uh, run by, by me and Demi Meharis. Um, like I said, we started in 2010. And um, I had, I was at the store one day and the guy that I was working with, he was an artist and a customer came in and I had a real bad interaction with him. I used to get really pissed off at people. And so I was, I was extremely pissed off at this guy and he left. And um, the, guy, the guy, my coworker was like, you know, just out of the blue, like, hey, if you want to write something, I'll draw it for you. Because he knew that I wanted to write comics or whatever, but it's very hard to find an artist. So that night I went to bed and I woke up and it was literally in a dream, this story appeared to me. It was the first time that that ever really happened. It like downloaded in my brain. Next few days, I put it all out, bottom line, whatever, I had a thing. Um, and that was the beginning of me being actively creative. You know, I always had story ideas, but that was when I actually started doing something. And um, I didn't end up doing it with that artist, but Dimmy came in and introduced himself as an artist looking for a writer. That never happens. That absolutely does not happen ever. And uh, I sent him away the first time. He came back a week later and he was like, no, I didn't find anybody. I was like, fine universe, fine, we'll do this. So we teamed up and uh, we've been making books ever since. You know, and it's been, um, that relationship and that collaboration um, has, has really, it, it's kept me alive the last 10 years. I, uh, uh, you know, would have made a lot of bad choices had I not had his support and that support of knowing that we were building something. And over the years, our output has ebbed and flowed, but that's life, you know, things happen. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I'm really proud of what we did. Um, we not only did we released, uh, we did three different books released five issues of one, maybe one of the other and one of the other. Um, but we also produced a thing called Nemesis Enforcer, which was a Seattle exclusive 
heavy metal style anthology, like heavy metal magazine. Hmm. And um, that is one of the things that I am most proud of that I had a hand in. Um, and 80% of the studios partnered with another friend of ours um, to produce this. And it was really cool to, you know, kind of be a part of the comic scene and to really connect with all these other artists. Because when you do, you feel charged to make art. And that's my favorite part about collaboration and meeting artists is, is getting that recharge. Um, and so uh, uh, we had a couple of dry years, the last two years, but we've been back at it um, with a new story that we're, we're very excited about. And after working on other people's stuff for two years, it's been phenomenal for me to get back to my own stuff. Um, Cause that's really what I want to do. I don't want to do other people's stuff, but I'm also broke and I also need money and I want to learn. So all these factors equal doing other people's work. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's your own personal projects that really make it. So well, I guess it just depends on the project. I think what you're doing on the rat Queens is just really high pleasing, beautiful work. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. We don't, we don't get a lot of feedback, to be honest, you know, yeah. so it's, it's nice to know that. Um, Cause again, like I said, I, I'm, I'm doing the last issue right now, you know, and I'm sitting here being like, this is fucking horrible. Who, you know, uh, Justin's going to fire me. It's just so bad, you know, and that's like every page, you know, I mean, and even here guys, 20, 30 years later, like, yeah, I had every time I started, that's how it goes, you know, well, Rat Queens 23, easy to get. Just go to Comixology. And yep. uh, yeah, we started at 22. 22 actually sold out, which was really cool. We got a second printing, and it was the first time since 2017 that the book had sold out. So clearly, people were, were digging what we were doing. And, you know, I think Rat Queens looks better than Gunning for Hits. And that's all I can ask. My only hope is that the newest thing I put out looks better than the last thing. That's all you can ask for. I think it's well. It's also a different sensibility because Gunning for Hits it has a gritty, uh, sometimes a minimal look to it. So it, it's a two different worlds. Absolutely, yeah. And and you know, learning how to do multiple styles with different books has been uh, uh, it's been a learning curve. <laughs> you know, for sure. It's hard enough to do it once. It's you know, let alone in a different style. You know. It's, so. Could you tell us uh, briefly a little bit about your process? What kind of uh, workstations situation oh, do you have? Sure, yeah. I, um, so basically, we'll just start from the beginning. You know, you get the script from the writer. Then we both, Justin and I, read the script. <clears throat> and then he draws it, uh, and I get black and white pages. And so you take those black and white pages, <clears throat> and I use uh, Photoshop mainly. Um, though I have, there's a couple other programs that I'll, I'll use, but mostly Photoshop. Uh, and I got a, a MacBook Pro and a Cintiq. For anybody that doesn't know what a Cintiq is, it's a screen that you draw on with a stylus. So, um, uh, and that's basically how it starts. And then um, I'll either flat it myself or have somebody to flat it. Um, actually, uh, uh, I don't know if you remember Morgan from Xanadu, but he's an artist. He makes comics as well. And yeah. so he's been kind of helping me out. Oh, nice. uh, which is cool yeah it's uh uh so that's good um but yeah and then um from there i i agonize and yell and scream and hate myself for however many hours it takes to finish that page and then i send it off to justin and he goes yeah it's great <laughs> um and that's a very honest honest depiction of of my working process um you know it's a lot of people a lot of artists have very specific processes or processes I don't know how you say that um but processes. I think yeah process but one of my things is I don't have one really down yet I've gotten like as many other things in my life about 80 percent of it down you know so every time I do a new project it's kind of back and forth like oh maybe I could try something new you know or maybe do this um but uh uh it really depends on the project you know when on the style but uh uh, yeah, you know, it's just, it's nothing, you know, super fancy. It's just, uh, you basically make everything as dark as possible, and then you add light. And that's the the easiest way to think of it, you know, because you look at a lot of art, and um, a lot of artists, they start with the mid-ground, and then you add shadow, and then you add light. 
what Moritat uh, has been teaching me and he comes from more of a painting background. And so painting, uh, unless you're using watercolor, you start dark and then you add light on top of it, you know? Um, and so that's what he does. Uh, and it cuts out having to add shadow. And for me, in my mind, it's easier just to focus on forms of light than forms of shadow or, or try to do both at the same time. You know, each one has its own specific thing. So like you're looking gunning for hits and that's why a lot of it looks dark is just because we started very dark and both Moritat and I uh, prefer comics that are a bit more moody than say superhero stuff. You know, you work for DC and Marvel and they're like, no, that that is Superman's red cape. That's going to be a specific red, you know? Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's just how it is. Um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, so trying to really unlearn my brain you know, my basic tendencies are to color like it's liquid in 1993 and it's battle chase or some shit. You know, I'm I'm all about the airbrush and the shine and my favorite color to use is purple, you know, kind of thing. And none of these things, Justin is like, no, no, these are not good things to be doing. Um, so it's, uh, uh, yeah, so the process is kind of back and forth, to be honest, you know. Yeah. Dark to light. Uh, but that's the basic sense. In yeah. painting, in painting, it's light to dark. It, it just, I, I can't even wrap my mind around going back and forth and thinking about that. But it would be light to dark because you can't ever get any lighter. Once you start, um, the, the lightest you can get, that's as light as you'll ever get. So that's as light as you get. Dark. Yeah, I mean, what? Uh, in, in, yeah, in painting, I mean, I thought with acrylics you went dark to light, but maybe I'm wrong. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, um, clearly, I don't know how to paint. To be honest, I've been learning. Justin's been teaching me how, um, which is cool. Uh, uh, the more that I do it organically, the easier it is to do it digitally. Um, yeah. And that's also a huge thing with um, a lot of artists these days, like super myself included, is that we just don't know how to do it organically, you know, because the technology has been there. Um, and especially for coloring, this is just how it's done. Nobody has time to organically color a comic book, you know, not like it used to be. Uh, so, um, it's, uh, it's really trying to learn those basic fundamentals and apply them to kind of this digital era, you know? Um, but yeah, so it's, it's, it's definitely, it's a certain mindset to put your in yourself in when you do digital art. Um, you know, but, uh, but yeah, and a lot of it's speed. So by going dark to light, by making it just the dark as it's going to be, you know, you don't have to go in and like lasso shadows or do anything like that. You know, the shadows are already there. You're just guiding the eye, you know? Because, I mean, if you're looking at a page and everything is hyper-rendered, you don't know where to look. If there's one panel where the light is really hitting and the other ones are kind of dim and that's where they want you to look, that's where you're going to look, you know? So it's just communication. Communication of information to the brain of a human to enjoy a story. You know, it's, it's very primal, which I love. You know, that's the comics are, are very primal, very powerful. You know, so well, I think that'll be a great takeaway for, for folks that are viewing this this deep into the interview. Yeah, if they stay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you just don't know about people's attention spans, but a lot of people surprise me, and, and they will come back and say, "You, oh no, I like, I just loved how you handled that interview." Uh, and I, I go into a lot of different worlds, like the that in the back. That's one of my paintings. Oh, cool. So it's a, a certain frame of mindset when you do a painting. Yeah. You, uh, uh, artwork of any kind, ink drawing, uh, digital art, an interview. I think of an interview as an art form. So, oh, absolutely. It it's oh. all uh, very. It's a mental workout. It is. It, that I am a huge believer that there is an absolute art to everything. There's an art to sweeping the floor. There's an yeah. art to taking out trash. There's yeah. an art to bartending. There's an art to teaching. There's an art to absolutely and utterly everything, you know? And uh, you're right. It's, you know, learning to put these different hats on and horse shutter your brain to be able to do that thing, which has been really hard for me. You know, it's been, it's been very hard to you know, not read a comic book and then take that inadvertently into what you're working on or watch a movie 
you know, or look outside or whatever it is. Like it could be raining outside. It's dark in Seattle in the winter. You don't want to work. Your page is going to suck that day. Like there's an infinite amount of factors that have to come together for you just even to create on a basic level, let alone for it to be fucking good. That's, that's like, you know, fucking God came down and like hit you with his fucking hand. And you're like, yes, my God, I had 10 minutes of like actual genuine inspiration. And then it goes and that's all you got for like the month. You know, it's, it's very fickle. Um, but uh, uh, for me, I just try to stay excited about what I'm doing and remember that there's worse. You know, I could be doing yard work. I could be cleaning toilets. You know, I, I, I could be, you know, serving rich people food, all of these things I've done that really don't enhance my life in any way, to be totally yeah. honest, you know, so uh, I, I consider myself beyond th uh, thankful and fortunate to be where I am. Um, and uh, uh, to have only been doing this three years, and I'm already doing two image books, you know, like, that's pretty fucking cool. And uh, uh, we're working on a new project right now, I don't know if I can announce yet, but uh, we're on the cover of previews, um, which anybody that doesn't know previews is like the comic industry magazine, you know, so it's pretty cool, you know, but it's good. It's, uh, it's tough, but it's very rewarding, just like everything else in life. You know, it's nothing's rewarding, but it's not tough. So... Well, I hope that we can uh, do one of these interviews again in, in the future. I don't want to overload you with too much, but maybe. I mean, one... yeah, you know, whatever. I mean, I, you know, if you're going to edit it, feel free. Just, yeah. Maybe we could throw in one, one more subject. Uh, yeah. What would you tell folks about uh, promoting their work? Because creating the work is just one part of it. The next part is getting it out into the world. I think of Michael Fife, for instance, who. Bife. Michelle Bife. Yeah. What's that? His, his name is Michel Fife. I'm, I'm sorry. You know, I, I did the same thing until he corrected me in person. I felt like such an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, I, I don't mean to say that to be any, be rude or anything. Um, but yes, he is the king of modern, like if, if there is one guy to try to attain a level of, for me, it's Fife. That dude does his own thing. Not only does he make it, but he promotes it, publishes it, ships it, all that stuff. Um, so like you mentioned, it's, it's, it's an entirely different thought process to market and promote your book, um, especially when you self-publish. You know? And after 10 years of self-publishing, I've learned that um, self-publishing fucking sucks. You know, It's hard as shit, and you don't make any money, and it, it takes time away from actually creating which is, is a tough thing, but it's a necessary evil. Um, and uh, learning what it takes to market your book, to hype your book, and to actually sell it on the floor in a comic book store are three different things of this overall separate thing that you have to learn. You know, um, social media uh, promotion, physical promotion, you know, person to person promotion, all of these things change as technology changes. And somebody at my age at 35, I'm already an old dinosaur. Is this is I don't even I can't even figure out TikTok. I cannot figure out Reddit. I, I can't. I barely can use Twitter. Okay. You know, I mean, and that's why people get paid to, to promote these things. Right. You know, yeah. to do social marketing, to do like that. Um, so I don't know if I would have any real advice um, for people other than finish what you're doing before you promote it, have the product before you start. Um, because if you're trying to finish and promote at the same time, it's two different hats and that doesn't work, or at least for me, you know, personally. Um, but having that there and um, knowing who your audience is, is, knowing who you're making the book for, who you're trying to reach, will help narrow your avenues of what you're, of, of where you put your, your money as far as promotion, you know, because it does cost money and the days of like, you know, Xeroxing your zine and handing it out to friends as much as I fucking love that, that's just not what you do anymore, I guess. I mean, you can, you know, but it's just, it's just, again, times have just changed, you know? Promotion used to be driving around in a van going from comic book store to comic book store, doing signings, 
you know, and, and even in my time at Xanadu, uh, those don't really work unless you're like a huge name and you're in like fucking, you know, Golden Apple Comics in LA, something like that, you know, it's, uh, it's a very strange thing. So I'm, I'm just kind of glad that I don't have to totally do it as much anymore because um, it's by far the hardest part of making any creative thing is, is marketing it, you know. Well, I, I don't want to hog into your your spotlight, but no, uh, no. I would say to start with, yeah, it, you have to juggle so many things. I'm older than you. I'm more like uh, Moritat's generation. Sure. Than yeah. Yours. yeah. I consider myself a, a, a Gen Xer, mm -hmm. vintage Gen Xer, but still with some some good years ahead of me. You've got a lot more years ahead of you, so don't don't yeah. feel bad. Yeah. And uh, if you don't know Twitter, well, shame on you. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but uh i can barely I, use it like I, I i have it and i'm just like duh, duh, duh. and then i'm like wait how do i see what this guy said how come i'm only getting half the conversation oh yeah <laughs> yeah the, the layout does leave a little bit to be just a little it's a little off uh instagram i like me too instagram me i like because it, it's it, the simplicity of it and it's uh very tailored to image people you just put your your comic or whatever, yep. and people respond to it in a more healthy way. I think. You're absolutely correct. Twitter is vile. Like Twitter is some vile shit. Facebook is just like, oh, look, I made food. Twitter is like, no, fuck you. I'm going to kill you for fucking this up. You're like, holy shit, it's a video game. You can chill, <gasps> you know? Um, <laughs> but yeah, and so, and, and knowing each of these social media things, again, goes with your audience and knowing where you want to put it. You know, doing like I learned a bunch for doing the promotion for Xanadu. Uh, I don't know how well I did, but I learned a lot, you know, as to like when to post, when to do this. Like, it's just all sorts of little bullshit that when you look at it and you don't know it, you're like, that's bullshit. And then you get in it and you're like, wow, this is really important, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but yeah, it's, you know, I should stop. <laughs> I certainly couldn't teach anybody how to do it you know so you can only say from your your perspective but this is the book gunning for hits that uh is uh still I, i'd say this this is still on on, on people's radars it, yeah it i mean it should still be available wherever in stores and comiXology you know and it's a it's a whole story it's not like it ends and there's not it, it doesn't uh like you're missing an ending or anything you know which is cool so it's a complete story um, but yeah, if you're into like, you know, anything like 80s, New York, music, gritty, crime, drugs, guns, violence, stuff like that, that's what we got. <laughs> okay, well, thanks so much, Casey, and we'll do it again sometime. Thank you. No, I really appreciate it. It was really, really great. And uh, I hope that somebody gets something out of this. Um, and like I said, I, I really appreciate it. And uh, I hope that we stay in touch. So okay. thank thanks you. Thanks a lot. Absolutely.